Welcome, 30 August. Hopefully you've all had a, a good summer so far. Welcome, um, Naimov, to the Board of Health, new member, um, replacing Robin. Um, so welcome. Thank you. First meeting. So excellent. All right. I think the first order of business is to get the meeting minutes from last time. Anybody has any changes? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion to approve those. I'll move to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Multiple seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Perfect. All right, so announcements. Desi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a couple of things. Commissioner Breitling did ask me to mention about um, on Monday night, the Cass County Commission did approve a 10% um, designation for those nursing staff at the Cass County Jail. Mm -hmm. Historically, we've had a really hard time um, hiring for those positions. It's kind of a difficult environment, so they did want to support those efforts. Right now we have a, a good strong team there and we're wanting to maintain that. So just so you're aware of that, that will be 100% covered by the county. They're also going to do a um, detailed market study trying to see what that correctional health designation might be for a salary. So it may change going forward, but right now, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll start at 10%. Um, the other update I was going to give was just on our strategic planning process. Um, as you all know, we started this in spring of 2022. We had public health um, consultants come in and work with us. 
Some was done virtually. Um, we got input throughout our staff and our leadership team. We also had a planning retreat in June of this year. So that was a day long where we affirmed our vision and mission and also established some guiding values for our agency. Um, we also looked at communi community and agency assets, challenges and opportunities, and then developed some strategic goals from that. I did late last week receive a draft copy of that. So I am meeting with our consultants on Monday um, virtually, and we will be going through how we're going to distribute that for more vetting and input. So we will be sending that again to all staff. We'll be sending it to the board and then some of our community partners to seek feedback on that. So we're really excited. It was a really, um, good process, everyone was really engaged and good staff support and looking forward to seeing what our final product will look like. <clears throat> Madam oh. Chair, yep. oh. uh, I just wanted to add that the increase that Desi referred to is to take effect September 1 of this year. Excellent. Uh, even though we're on a calendar year budget mm -hmm. and it was not included in the 2022 budget, we were able to make room for it from other sources. Excellent. Thank you for supporting those mm -hmm. nurses. That's really important. Yep, definitely. Okay, and thank you, Desi, for the update on the strategic plan. Sounds like made good progress on it. Look forward to, to seeing that draft and being able to provide some input on that process too, so excellent. Okay, so next on the agenda is the Board of Health bylaws. And so um, a subgroup had been formed to take a look at um, bylaws. They haven't been updated in quite some time. So um, Lynn and Arlette and I um, formed that subgroup and have met um, numerous times to, to review kind of the, the bylaws and make some proposed changes. So I just want to walk through this today, um, gather some, some feedback. I don't know that we'll feel comfortable enough to take action on it today because you're just seeing it, but um, hopefully, hopefully um, you're aligned with where we were at in terms of um, the updates that we've made. So first um, proposed update is really just to the mission. Um, as we started talking about the current mission, we started thinking about other things to list on, you see that A, B, C, and D list. There's we sh you know multiple other things that can be added to that. And when we think about you know, the mission of this board, we wanted to just simplify things a little bit, um, make it a little bit more easier to digest and remember <laughs> than what we had, um, what we have currently. So um, the mission of the Board of Health shall be to support and advocate for improving the health of the public, achieving equity and health status and support public health department's goals to really secure a safer, healthier and stronger um, communities. So that's the proposed change to the mission piece. Um, we really felt strongly about the, the support and the advocating piece of this um, as we think about um, our role in, in advocating for good public health um, policies and, and enhancing the, the health of our communities. So trying to simplify things a little bit. Any questions or feedback on that piece before we move to some of the other changes? Okay. All right, and they gave me the clicker, so. Mm -hmm. All right, so then the next piece um, it lays out some membership um, expectations. So we did have a section previously um, on the bylaws that um, talked about you know, responsibilities. Um, one of the things that we looked at is other Board of Health bylaws just to get some ideas. Um, so a lot of these things actually come from um, Grand Forks and their Board of Health. And so we felt it was important to talk kind of right up front about membership and you know the commitment that you're making as part of this Board of Health and understanding the purpose and the policies um, around Fargo Cast Public Health actively participating um, in the strategy pieces that you know Desi just spoke to, being knowledgeable of the mission and vision and really being an advocate out in the community. Um, so some of these things were represented in other parts of the bylaws, but we felt it was really important to bring it up and to highlight a few additional ones. 
you know, attending community functions, being aware of the changing needs of the community um, was also um, something that we talked about that wasn't necessarily represented elsewhere. So just being mindful of, of trends and things that we as a, as a board should be mindful of and if we can support public health in their efforts um, for things that are emerging as public health concerns and being on top of those items. And then, um, so that list there, any feedback or Lynn or Arlette, do you wanna add anything to that piece of it? So the other piece that we looked at and just reviewing um, the bylaws from other boards of health was just the, the makeup of the membership. And so we previously had nine members um, appointed to three-year terms by Fargo City Commission. And we had um, a county commissioner that was designated by Cass County, West Fargo, um, Fargo School Board member, um, a healthcare provider, behavioral health professional, community representatives at large. Um, and we wanted to simplify this. Well, first of all, reduce the number of members. We seem to have a higher amount of members than what was typical um, in looking you know, across North Dakota and also nationally. So reducing that to seven members with three-year terms um, and also introducing a term limit. So board members should not exceed three consecutive three-year terms. Um, so certainly um, providing a number of opportunities to, to contribute to the board, but having a, a limit there. And then still having the member from the Fargo City Commission and a county commissioner from the Cass County Commission, but then introducing just five at-large members. So, you know, seeking to have somebody that is a healthcare provider, at least one behavioral health professional, and then those with extensive experience in public health. So just making sure that as an advisory board that we have um, public health professionals that can advise um, on the topics that need to be advised on. And so simplifying things a little bit, I think also um, just in the interest of um, fairness, you know, we have Fargo Public Schools represented today. Um, we don't have West Fargo Public Schools. We don't have a lot of other public school um, representation, and so um, not that we can't have somebody from the Fargo School Board on here as one of the at-large members. It just seemed um, like there were other opportunities to be more inclusive of, of other school boards as well. So that's probably the most significant change is going from seven or going from nine to seven members on the board. Um, I think with that, um, also thinking about, you know, how do we implement something like that? We need to think about, you know, re potentially reapplying um, for the positions to make sure that we're meeting those qualifications um, and targeting, you know, somewhere the big first quarter of this next year to, to do that. Um, just to make sure, again, that we have um, public health experts and, and healthcare providers uh, represented on the on the board to advise public health agency. So that's the most significant one. I have a question. Um, how do then do you propose that the that there's the reduction? Will it just be when a term expires, or are you going to what are your what is your proposal for that? So the proposal for that is to have everybody reapply for the positions. Now, the appointed positions that for um, City of Fargo and Cass, Cass County would remain, but the rest of us would, would reapply um, for us, and we'd probably need to stagger those terms as well to make sure we're not all coming off at the same time, but we would look to, to do that by the first quarter of the new year so that when we start the new year we have kind of the makeup of the new board of health would be my proposal which would align with the implementation of the updated bylaws. correct correct and we also made a change to be a little bit more clear it's in the on the next um slide and i'll get to it but um just the election of the officers it just says annually and so we move that to be you know, the first meeting of every year, so then it's clear exactly when we're going to elect officers, so that also aligns nicely with the makeup of the new board. 
Some of these changes, though, also require um, the city commission to make some ordinance changes. So once we approve it, it will have to go to city commission for them to approve the modifications needed in an ordinance as well. And I do want to recognize, Chelsea, for the work that you've put into reading a lot of other bylaws for other public health departments, because that took a lot of work. And I think it makes sense to make sure that ours align with what we're seeing as being the standard. If I could, Madam Chair, if I could add a little bit of perspective, too, in the broader level mm -hmm. um, for the entire city, uh, we are, and I should say, um, there's a few other commissions and committees that were going through the same process of um, figuring out how to make a commission or a board more efficient and effective. And uh, we're collapsing some committees into others and um, hopefully getting more of the commissions in line with bylaws being uh, written and formalized as well as looking at the membership of all of the, the citizen advisory kind of boards, and this is one of them. So it's part of a, a broader effort. There are questions. Has the uh, legal staff of the city of Fargo mm -hmm. reviewed your proposals? Yes, and so we, we do have Ian in the in the audience as well. <laughs> so um, they did review, and they were the ones that um, indicated to us that we would need an ordinance update as well. So um, we talked through that process. Do we have an access to this? I'll make sure that you have access to this. Um, we can probably share the PowerPoint, right, Lori? OK, so that way you can see it side by side. Um, there's a lot of track changes on it, um, so it got to be a little bit messy, but this is really clean. So thank you, Lori, for, for putting this together. Thank you. All right. Um, so no changes for on this particular slide um, other than what I discussed earlier in terms of at the first meeting of the calendar year, that's when we'll determine the officers. Um, and then there's also a term um, related to, to the chair not to exceed three consecutive years. Um, so just making sure that we're, we're changing those um, officers on a, on a timely basis as well. Is there something else you're going to mention? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I thought you were going to say something. No, Sorry. No, no. <laughs> I'm just contemplating here. No. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Uh, meetings, uh, the only thing that we added, I think, is of significance to the meeting section was the, the public comment piece. Um, that was missing from the, the prior bylaws, and we certainly want opportunity for there to be public comment, so wanted to make sure that we added that in, and that would be consistent with changes that I think other committees are making as well that piece. Um, I think, you know, the public oh. noticed there was a small change. I'm sorry, so. I have a question about the mm -hmm. um, order of business. Who sets the agenda? This was my, I kind of asked this last time, who sets the agenda? Because it just says that the agenda will, um, uh, see, a special meeting should be specified on the notice, which should be the meeting agenda transmitted to each member. But how do we arrive at that meeting agenda? So I have planning meetings as well as Lynn with, with Desi um, to talk about what would be pertinent to bring to the board. Um, any board member can bring agenda topics too. Um, so if you emailed you know, Desi or myself, we can, we can talk about that. We usually meet every month to talk about potential uh, topics for the board health agenda. Okay. And um, so anything that you want to propose, we can talk through that and certainly add it. Okay, so you did change that because you say the yep. pr proposed agenda items need to be approved by the Board of Health's chairman. Previously, it had to be approved by the entire membership. Right. Okay, Correct. so that that's okay. Simplified that, All right, sorry. Good. Yeah, just yes, trying to you're, understand. You're yep. So, perfect. So hopefully that, that makes the process a little bit easier as well in getting a, agenda items on. 
Um, there was a small um, change in the public notice, just that you know, public notice to be given in advance of the meeting. We called out the Fargo form and previously, I think there's, we put it on the website, not that we wouldn't put it in the form, it just um, wanted to, to simplify that piece as well. All right. Can we go back one slide? I think so. There we go. So I, oh, public comment was not in the bylaws before? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, and then I don't think we made any changes to the voting and or compensation. We're all volunteer um, board members, so there's no compensation there. Um, the voting piece, I don't believe, changed at all either. Just doing a quick glance just to make sure. Okay. And then responsibilities of the board. So some of the responsibilities from the current version we moved up to the beginning part of the bylaws under those expectations of board members. Um, other things um, stayed within this section. We did some reordering of it. Um, you'll notice and um, be a community advocate for public health is, is the first one that was part of the responsibilities um, previously, but we just wanted to, to put it front and center um, and list it as one of the top items there. Um, we also added um, a, a note on number five um, related <coughs> to strategic planning and providing <coughs> guidance as needed. So to Desi's earlier point about um, providing a, a draft strategic plan and providing some input, uh, making sure that we um, have some involvement in that process. Um, we also added number seven, um, assist in identifying and prioritizing programs using data highlighting community needs. So um, looking at information, if there's you know competing priorities, what can we do in, in helping um, advise on, on what programming we may want to prioritize over something else. Um, there's a lot of priorities um, within the community. So just calling that out um, and the importance of, of looking at the data to, to help us make some of those decisions. And I believe the last one, number nine, is also um, a newer one. And this one really stems from um, if there's significant changes within the health department, in order for us to advocate for that, we just need to know that there is significant changes. So it's not that every um, minor update that happens within those policies and procedures needs to come to us, but just for an awareness, if there's a significant shift in how we're, the health department's operating, that we have awareness and can speak to that and advocate to that for that um, should we get asked by somebody in the community. Um, but otherwise, as mentioned, other things that maybe don't appear on here on this list were added to the list um, further up. So, question. Mm -hmm. um, on number 11, I'm just looking at it. It said, uh, Fargo CAS Public Health Remain Political Neutral Agency. Um, why that should, um, just, can you put it to as number 10? Because my understanding, there's a lot of people not, uh, sometimes, you know, they don't know that there's a neutrals and mm -hmm. political on the side. If you put that in there, it would make it easy for them to see this is, an, is a neutral political position where they should stand. Because sometimes it's best you see it there and then mm -hmm. we show it to them. We could certainly add it to this list too. Um, it is on the expectations towards the top, so I can go back to that one. It's worded a little bit differently. Okay. Um, but it's the last one under members shall um, uphold the mission and vision of Firecast Public Health by remaining a political objective and unbiased in analysis and guidance. Good. I'm glad okay. I didn't see that one. I was <laughs> like, ooh, we need to add it in there. <laughs> no, no, but it's in there. So um, just wanted to move it up a little bit further. So, okay. And I think. That was the last major change. I don't think there's anything that was changed in can any of these pieces. So that's the, the changes that we've made thus far. 
said I, I'm not sure if folks are feeling comfortable enough to take a vote having just walked through it today. Um, so certainly um, understand the, the need to absorb and, and provide feedback. But if somebody, if folks do feel comfortable, we could certainly move it forward and, and take it to the city for the ordinance changes needed, but completely um, fine with however you all want to proceed. I'd like to make a motion that we have a bit of study time for this and maybe talk to people who will be affected by these changes and get some feedback that way before okay. we make any motion, any movement. Okay, fair enough. I agree, so I can look at it a bit more um, so that then I can make the right decision. Yep, definitely. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we'll make sure that we put this on. Is it possible for us to um, get a list of what the Fargo City Ordinance changes mm -hmm. yeah. are or will have to be? Yeah. Yep, we can definitely do that. Yeah. I think um, the, so the mission um, is in Sydney ordinance, ordinance, so that piece will have to be changed. Um, I'm not sure if the membership was or not, but yeah, I'll, we'll make sure you get that along with these slides doing the comparison, so. Just out of curiosity, you said that when you did this, you had to check with you know Fargo ordinances. Does this also mesh anyway with Cass County ordinances that need to be correlated? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. Don't think <clears throat> so. Okay. All right. Well, we'll make sure we put this on the agenda for our next board meeting and revisit this. If we have questions in the in the meantime, don't hesitate to. Reach out. Madam no, Chair. Mm -hmm. If I could ask the um, a legal question here in regards to the process. So with ordinance changes, would that have to precede the bylaws changes approval or can they can we do the bylaws and then the ordinance follows? The well, this board being an advisory board, it'd be a recommendation to the city commission. So you could propose these bylaw changes to the city commission. The city commission would then probably, in one collective, do the ordinances and the bylaws together. If I could get some clarification on that, because there are numerous commissions in the city where, and in fact, our bylaws indicate that that it's the board's accountability and authority to actually approve the bylaws. Are you saying the bylaws need to also be approved by the commission because that's not been the practice? Only where the bylaws are, where the, the changes to the bylaws are, would actually be, need to be changed in the ordinance. So for instance, the mission statement and the bylaws comes from the ordinance. So, right. we, couldn't, so we couldn't change the bylaw mission statement. Okay, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for um, time and attention. Thank you, um, Commissioner Preston and, and Lynn for assisting with, with this review. So it certainly wasn't um, done by, by me. We were collectively meeting on a regular basis and walking through what makes makes sense in terms of updating the, the bylaws. So I appreciate the, the support and attention that you both have given it as well. So, all right. Next on the agenda is an immunization and monkeypox updates. While we're getting that connected, I'll just start with the monkeypox update um, while we're getting that connected just for sake of time. Um, so I will provide an update. Um, so monkeypox is a rare, um, it's kind of in the media a lot now, but it was a sometimes life-threatening zoonotic infection. It's endemic in West and Central Africa. Um, they have the West clade and the Central clade. Um, 
this particular outbreak that's affecting um, the United States and the world is the Western clade, um, which is less severe than um, the Central clade. Um, specific animal reservoir is unknown, but um, it's likely small animals like um, monkeys, um, rats, and things like that, just smaller mammals. Um, it is caused by orthopox virus, um, which is in the same family or class of viruses as a smallpox um, disease or smallpox virus. And it can be spread from infected animals to humans and person to person. Um, respiratory secretion, skin to skin with infected bodily fluids, um, and then fomites. And most of this particular outbreak is that skin to skin contact. Um, here it is again, um, how it's spread, respiratory, touching items, and then pregnant people can pass it through the placenta. And then, um, so situational update. Um, countries that typically did not see monkeypox began to see cases in spring of 2022. Um, most cases are amongst the MSM or the men who have sex with men population. Um, I believe it's like 98% or more cases are amongst that population. Um, the CDC is continuing to work with state, federal, and international partners. Um, previously, um, there were only state labs or LRNs that could do monkeypox testing, but the CDC brought on commercial laboratories to conduct testing to increase nationwide capacity. Um, that really hasn't impacted North Dakota so much as most of our, our lab has ample capabilities to conduct the testing at this time. I don't think that any facilities in North Dakota are sending to outside labs from my recollection. Um, it does not spread easily between people without close contact, so the threat remains low. Um, so just a little bit, it started in May of 2022, Massachusetts, most cases again are amongst the MSM. Co-infection with STIs has occurred, so that's why we're recommending that if um, individuals who um, have a monkeypox type rash, are also screened for other STIs such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and even HIV. Um, atypical presentation, um, we're seeing a lot of genital and peri perianal lesions and proctitis. Hospitalizations are low, and in the United States, we've had zero deaths. Um, I know that there have been some deaths internationally, but the United States um, continues to have zero deaths related to this outbreak. Here's just some pictures of the symptoms, fever, headache, muscle aches, back aches, swollen lymph nodes, chills, exhaustion, a rash that looks like pimples um, that appears on the face, inside of the mouth, other parts of the body. Um, the rash typically goes through different stages before healing completely and typically lasts two to four weeks. Um, worldwide cases, um, I pulled this yesterday. Um, worldwide, we've had about 40, a little over 40,000 cases. Um, of those, 40,000 are in cases or in countries that typically have not historically reported monkeypox, and then about 400 in countries that um, have historically reported monkeypox. This is a map of the U.S. Um, I did not put the key on there because it wouldn't fit very nicely, but um, the light blue um, are lower case counts, and then the dark blue like our California, Texas, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, New York um, are our higher case counts. Um, North Dakota has identified three cases of monkeypox. Um, we're continuing to work with the healthcare provider software consultation and testing when indicated. Um, so right now when a provider suspects monkeypox, they do call the state and either myself or one of my colleagues um, does take that call and we actually approve the testing um, through our state LRN or our state lab. Um, we work with those providers on administering PEP and PEP++ to those who is indicated for. So PEP is given to those contacts who are in direct contact with someone who has a positive case. So it's best given within four days, um, but it can be given up to 14 days. Um, if it's given within that time frame, it greatly reduces the likelihood of any contacts um, developing monkeypox. And PEP++ is given to those who may be at risk. So North Dakota just this week opened up PEP++ to anyone who identifies as um, gay, bisexual, or uh, individual who is a man who has sex with man. Um, and then we have done probably about 50 tests at our state lab, and then subsequent diagnoses. Um, we don't know all the diagnoses since um, not all of these are reportable, but when following up with provider, we have seen folliculitis, shingles, syphilis, chicken pox, and then hand, foot, and mouth disease as um, alternative diagnoses. 
prevention, um, avoid the skin-to-skin -skin contact, do not handle clothes, bedding, or towels of a sick person. So when we educate these people who are um, develop disease, um, we do let them know to do their own laundry instead of having someone else do their laundry. Um, if possible, isolate away from others in your home if you have roommates. Um, wash your hands often. And then there are vaccination and Fargo Cass Public Health is one of our vaccine sites. They were one of our first to be brought on. Um, it is a Genios vaccine, which was originally approved for smallpox. Um, this vaccine is used to be given um, subcutaneously. Um, it is now given interdermally. So it's given, it's very similar to a TB Manto test. Um, that was changed in order to um, increase supply because we can get three to five doses out of a vial versus one dose out of a vial. Um, the only limitation with that is um, once you pop that vial, it's only good for eight hours. So you need to have um, people ready or people on a wait list. And I, Fargo Cast has set up a wait list um, so that they do have people able and willing to come in and get vaccination. But they've been great to work with um, on giving PEP and PEP++. And then there is treatment available and Tecker Tech. Tecoviramat or TPOX um, to say it easier. Um, and then this is given through the strategic national stockpile, just like the vaccine. So that means since these are given to us federally, um, there can be no charge for the vaccine or treatment to individuals. So um, this is given to free to individuals. And um, if someone is indicated for TPOX, um, they would just have to work with the Department of Health and our Department of Operations Center um, in order to get that um, from their provider. And that's kind of it. Um, just a quick overview. Um, just know that Fargo Cass Public Health is doing a great job at administering vaccine. I believe that they've given um, over 40 to 50 doses. Um, and then the state did partner with another organization, Canopy Health in town during um, FM Pride. And we were able to give over 100 doses at Pride in the park. So um, okay. we are getting vaccine in the arms of people. And the benefit of that is it will save um, potential increase in cases and um, more time later on by doing what we're doing now. Thank you. Is this one working too? Okay. Thank you, Brenton. Do you guys have any questions about monkeypox? Ben here. So how are people finding out about the vaccine availability? Um, we do have a vaccine finder website directly located on our website and then um, through social media and then anyone that we call or anyone that we educate um, that identifies as MSM um, during our case interview since right now I have a team of epidemiologists that follow up on anyone who tells positive for gonorrhea, chlamydia or not chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV. Um, if they have not received the vaccine we educate them and let them know where they can go to get vaccine. I can add too that providers, uh, for example, at Sanford have, um, they've identified people and they have even waiting lists um, of people that are ready to go. And then when we're aware of more vaccine, they just call those people and <coughs> them. I have a question. Uh, you said you administered over 100 vaccines. Was it that just at those events or statewide or I mean, countywide? Just, just at that event. Um, okay. So statewide, um, North Dakota received a very limited amount of vaccine, I think. Um, we had initially only received like 100 doses and then they wow. increased it. So um, we um, are working to get more vaccine into arms of people. But right now, I think it's probably closer to two to 300 total doses have been given out. And that's also available on our website. And I should have put a screenshot of that in there. But um, we do have a vaccine dashboard on the North Dakota Department <clears throat> of Health website. Thank you. This has kind of been rapidly changing, but as Brinton said, the very first allotment that came, Fargo Cass and Bismarck Public Health were the only two entities in the state. And at that time, we got 20 doses. Um, and we were only doing, that was before we were doing this new way he talked. So we had to hold um, 10 back. And we, so we essentially, we were only able to vaccinate 10 people in the initial first round and then save the second dose. Now it's gotten better, but it's been a little um, yes. slow moving. So to say 100 at Pride is a really big improvement. Yes. And it is a two dose series. So um, um, Dr. Newman made a good point that um, we do have to be able to um, ensure that we have second doses for some people. Um, just because the CDC and the Department of Health believe that um, the two doses is, is most effective. So we have to ensure that we can get a second dose in the arms of people 28 days later. I have a question. What is the age for 
um, what is the age for this vaccine, the monkey pack, uh, no, monkey pack to be administered? Good question. Um, so to be given interdermally um, or similar to the Mantua test, if it's 18 or older, um, they did approve it to be given subcutaneously or one dose out of every vial down to... I think it was emergency use. Emergency use. Eight and under. Eight and under. Because they're considered higher risk for complications. So they are doing it under emergency use for pediatrics. Yep. And um, we can um, definitely work with those providers that have someone in that age group, but um, it is just a different vaccine delivery method for those under 18. Okay. What about for the pregnant woman? Are they allowed to take this one too as well? Mm -hmm. Yep. Pregnant women are allowed. Um, this is a vaccine that has been around for, I believe it's been approved for 10 years for um, smallpox. Um, so it has been tested and gone through many clinical trials and it has been approved for um, pregnant women. The only um, the only thing that they ask is that individuals um, wait after if they received a COVID vaccine, but more and more studies are coming out that, um, and if needed to be given as PEP, um, then that um, window period um, doesn't apply. Thank you. And then also, what about for those individuals that who may have an allergy or just allergic, Do the, uh, is there any complication that you might if so that would be a contraindication, a contraindication. So anyone who's allergic to any of the components of the vaccine, um, just like other vaccines, wouldn't be able to receive this particular vaccine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'm going to attempt a technical feat here. <laughs> One of the comments that I had heard was it seemed like they declared it a, a public health emergency pretty quickly at the federal level, but I think one of the things that folks don't necessarily understand is that allows for more rapid vaccination distribution, so hopefully that helps. Um, I think so many folks think about public health emergencies and COVID, and it took a while to get mm -hmm. there, um, and it, so it feels early, but hopefully it really helps to ramp up the vaccination distribution. Yes, and you know, since vaccines have been more widely available, um, cases have started to fall in some cities like New York and in the United Kingdom. So um, we're hoping that um, we start to see this trend nationwide even more so. You indicated that the, uh, if you were allergic to one of the contents, how do you know what the contents are? That would be on the vaccine like um, fact sheets um, that we're required to um, provide or pr required to um, let the person know what's in it um, prior to administering the vaccine. It's like a screening question to be eligible mm -hmm. to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Imagine there's pretty fairly few people that would qualify or would fall into the contraindication. So do, do they only um, like to get the, the monkey pack vaccine, do they just have to go to their primary care to be able to discuss that with them? Or should they be able to come to Cass County Public Health to get more, especially for the Fargo area residents? So in the Fargo area, we do have um, four providers um, or four health systems that do have vaccine availability and they can check on our um, vaccine finder website. Um, those are Canopy Health, Sanford Health, Essentia, and Fargo Cass Public Health. Um, <coughs> the vaccine supply is limited, so they may have to be put on a wait list, but um, we do have um, four providers in the community that do have vaccine available for those individuals. So they just may just need to reach out to their provider and um, ask, and if they don't have a provider, um, Fargo Cass Public Health um, would just do a phone screen with them and add them to the wait list or get them on the schedule. Thank you. Um, quick question again, sorry. Is, um, is it free for the, for the public or do they have to use their insurance or do they have to pay out of pocket or anything So like the that? vaccine itself, since it comes from the strategic national stockpile, um, is free. Um, but um, facilities may charge an office visit or administration fee, and that would be a benefit of public health for those who are underinsured or not insured. Um, they would be able to slide those fees Thank you. as they're able to. Thank you. Great questions. Yeah, I was just about to say the same. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, everyone, for the good questions. Yeah, yes, good. no problem. Thanks for all the work that you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Um, well, hopefully mine won't be nearly as exciting, but I was asked to um, give a brief update about just uh, where we are in our state with overall immunizations. Um, one of the unfortunate fallouts of the pandemic that we're all aware of is um, families and children came to their pediatrician and did their wellness checks a little less. Um, and so not only um, are we seeing less annual checkups and less things like that, but our vaccination rates have, have dipped. So I was just going to review that um, a little bit for you guys so you're in the know. Um, so this is a picture of my own, my own three kids getting vaccinated. But um, just to set the stage, this is really a nationwide problem. So this, um, this was uh, some CDC data that was pu published in their uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report uh, just this past April. And we're really observing a trend in declining immunization coverage. Um, this uh, looked at immunization programs and annual kindergarten vaccination assessments to monitor school entry vaccination coverage uh, with all the states that require these. And what you can see here is for the previous school year, 2020 to 21, um, the coverage was approximately 94% for all school required vaccines. Um, that's much lower than what, what we're used to. Um, that was approximately one percentage point lower than the previous school year. Um, and our exemption rate uh, nationwide has remained low at about 2.2%. Um, but this really has important implications for public health and, of course, for provider practices. Uh, we know that, again, disruptions caused by COVID-19 really, really reduced um, this effort, and it even reduced schools' efforts to sort of um, monitor this and, and uh, enforce this. So this, uh, in comparison, is just North Dakota kindergarten immunization rates for that same school year. I tried to pull the same number for comparison. Um, and you can just really see uh, we're even lower than the national average. So we're sitting at about 93% um, for most, about 95 for Hep B. But the goal for us is 95%. Um, studies tell us that's the optimal herd immunity, we call it, or population level immunity. Um, to prevent outbreaks. So when these numbers dip below 95%, we're, we're really sitting at risk for like a measles outbreak, for example, or a polio outbreak. Um, Dr. Newman, could yeah. I go back one? Yes. Um, what happened in between 2014 and 16, that big jump in vaccines? You know? um, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I have a theory <laughs> um, because I work with Dr. Paul Carson and some people at NDSU. They did a vaccine trial or a, sort of a survey study around that time. Um, the very short answer is it's kind of it's kind of complicated, but um, they did an effort statewide to make sure that the um, schools were actually enforcing uh -huh. the required. That's okay. the very short answer. Okay. So the vaccine rates actually, well, they might have changed, but it was more that they were enforcing um, um, the forms and, and making people actually come turn in the vaccine records. Okay. Some of our rural places were a little more lax on that, is yeah. my understanding. All right. Thank you. And that's a good question. Um, so this is this um, the same trend. So this again is looking at kindergarten uh, rates, and we've we've seen that um, continue as well. Well, so this was um, let's see here our our data from the 2021-2022 school year, and again the DTAP, MMR, and polio rates fell from 93 percent the previous year to 92 percent. So we were even lower. Um, we saw our chicken pox fall from 93.2% to 91.8. That was interesting in your presentation, Brenton, that some of those monkey poxes were chicken pox cases. Um, that's pretty unusual. We normally don't even see chicken pox, but with a herd immunity of 91%, that's probably why. Uh, our hep B also slightly declined, and that one's a little concerning because hepatitis B is the one that we typically do in infancy at the two, four, and six, actually at birth now in two, four, and six months. So we're even starting to see that occur uh, in young babies. Um, again, these rates are just far below our desired targets uh, and put our, risk at, uh, put our community at risk for preventable disease outbreaks. And then of note, the bottom curve here on the left displays the rise in state-level exemption rates. 
Um, the national average, I told you, for kindergarten entry was around 2.2%, and that's been pretty stable. North Dakota is one of only 15 states that allow not only medical and religious exemptions, but we also allow phys uh, excuse me, philosophical or personal belief exemptions. And as you can see, those are the ones um, that are steadily increasing, and we are well above national average. Um, so our kindergarten vaccine rates are slightly superior here in Cass County. So that's the good news when we compare to the rest of the state. Um, our chickenpox in particular, we are uh, a full percentage point higher than the rest of the state. Um, Cass County also has lower exemption rates um, when compared to the rest of North Dakota, but we do remain higher than the national average. And then this was just another example of, um, you know, we know that we're seeing this phenomenon na nationwide. This is some national data that's showing wellness visits uh, for the adolescent age groups that have been below average in childhood immunizations have decreased. Um, so this, you know, was showing uh, in particular um, the adolescent age group there, and then we saw the HPV vaccine um, decline from people not coming in for those visits. So at Sanford anyway, we've done huge um, efforts around this, sending out reminder letters. Uh, we now offer these vaccines at sports physicals. We're even offering them at urgent care visits when kids come in for other reasons. So there is an effort underway there. Um, I'll try and breeze through the rest of this. So this is just similar. This looks at now the middle school age. That's the other time vaccinations are required by school. Um, this in particular is showing um, seventh grade immunization data. And you can just see that we're suboptimal again. Um, this is from the 2020-2021 school year. Um, RTDAP and meningococcal in particular are um, very low. Whoops, sorry about that. And then this trend continued into the next school year, the 2021-2022. This again is showing seventh grade data for North Dakota. Um, our Tdap coverage fell from 89.4 percent. Excuse me, fell to 89.4 percent from 91 the previous year, and our meningococcal rates fell to 88 um, percent. So very, very low. Um, we are also seeing age, um, seeing exemption, exemption rates increase in this age cohort. And then this is that same thing. And then this just shows us the 11th grade. Um, data that's the other time that these are required um, the one thing I would say is um, we're kind of holding steady for this age group at least for the early birth cohorts but you can appreciate the meningococcal uh, rates are quite low for that age as well so um, Fargo cast public health oops I think I got off by a slide I apologize <laughs> this is just more more of our, our statewide data. I'm happy to go through if you guys have questions. But um, I Fargo Cass Public Health has really made efforts to have walk-in and back-to-school um, immunizations. We've tried to do a, a number of those in our community. We're hosting back-to-school vaccine clinics and doing ad campaigns on the radio and trying to do a social media push as well to the right, remind the public um, of this issue. I'm happy to take any questions. So I'm curious on the enforcement question um, I have a daughter going into seventh grade and so I sent in the forms and it was you know just email it to um, someone at the school but I'm just now I'm almost tempted to maybe I shouldn't have but to see what happens I, I'm just curious if if we're kind of in another pattern where we seem to be a little bit more lax in the enforcement part just given the impact it seemed to have had in in previous years yeah I don't know that I'll be able to answer that in detail okay. I think it varies Definitely it varies by school district and even maybe by school building because mm -hmm. um, usually it's just one administrator who's kind of handling those forms. Um, you know, in some cases, we've heard stories anecdotally that um, we, we make it so easy almost that, you know, when, when someone comes for kindergarten and, and we say, okay, you, you can't come to school until you have these vaccines or there's this sign, there's this exemption form you can sign right here. Um, that some t we're trying to move away from that, but sometimes you know, logistically um, making it a little easier for people. Chelsea, I can add to that too. Um, they usually have an October 1st deadline for the schools, so it's probably not an immediate thing, but they usually have some time to get, you know, people have a, a deadline to make. Also, if you're making efforts to, you know, if you have an appointment scheduled, 
there'll be some leniency with that, but you know, they are in, in the Fargo area, they're pretty good at enforcing when you get to those mm -hmm. October dates, but it does take a little bit to get through. And with new students cycling in, sometimes that's more difficult too to track down. Okay. And these, these were really only data for the school required vaccines. Um, we know our other vaccines we recommend that aren't even required by school are, are low as well. That's why I brought up the HPV slide because that is very low as well. So. so I have a quick, well, a few comments and questions. So I assume that per school and district, they're really held accountable to the Department of Public Instruction for enforcing, I would assume. That's okay, I can. I'm not sure that I know okay. the answer to that. Okay, I think the, the North Dakota Department of Health dashboard does list individual school buildings as well. So if you go mm -hmm. on our. Oh, that's right. Um, if you go on our website, you can find um, vaccine level data for individual schools. So oh. I could go on there and compare Lincoln Elementary to um, L.A. Berger Elementary to um, even Kindred or mm -hmm. Oak Grove Elementary or um, so, St. Anthony. Oh, it's showing your slides again. But yeah, that was where I got my data. I would just do like the whole state of North Dakota and then I would just do Cass County. But you're right, you can go a step further and just mm -hmm. do one school building. But to your question, I'm, I'm really unsure who is... And only saying that for consistency's sake across the state, you know. Yeah. But um, I can look into that. And then I was going to ask you in which would have been probably a difficult question to answer, but do we attribute the decrease in vaccination rate to just being behind from COVID and lack, you know, decreased lack, um, access or COVID-related vaccine misinformation, disinformation? I think your your data on the personal exemption, um, personal belief exemption answers that question for me, um, which you said that is per state, so each state is different with what sort of exemptions they allow? Yeah. So like our neighbors in South Dakota, for example, don't allow a personal exemption or a philosophical. They only allow medical and um, religious. Okay. We're, we're in the minority. At the, I thought we were one of six or seven, but when I looked it up, it was 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. It's interesting. Other questions for Dr. Newman? Hopefully I'll have better news next time. <laughs> we update. Thank, Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right, Jan's up, up next. Update on the Downtown Engagement Center. Hi everyone, I'm just going to give a quick, uh, a brief update on the Downtown Engagement Center and a few other services we're providing over at Harm Reduction uh, as part of public gas, or public Cast public health efforts. Sorry, it's been a super long day already. <laughs> um, so the Downtown Engagement Center, which is located in the, in the former Fargo Police Department building, we're still trying to get open at, at full capacity. Part of the issue there is just making sure we have enough staff to operate that program in addition to our other programs. Uh, we do have a number of other services on site. Uh, some of those I've mentioned before, we have the Homeless Health Clinic operating five days a week uh, from 8 a.m. to noon. We also have uh, presentation partners and housing navigators who provide tons and tons of support regarding uh, access to housing, moving people toward housing, and then supports once people are housed. We also have Native Inc. out of Bismarck providing care coordination, which is an evidence-based approach to um, connecting people to the services needed to help people move toward their goals for sustaining housing, sustaining recovery, and so on. Uh, the sheet that I handed out earlier is a snapshot into kind of the uh, a day in the life of harm reduction or a month in the life uh, in this case. Um, our numbers were a little bit low in, in July, uh, a few different contributing factors to that. We did see, unfortunately, uh, a number of the folks that we serve were able to get into the jail, I guess. I don't know, if, I shouldn't say it like that, I guess, but... Uh, we had a number of people arrested in the month of July. Um, that was really Fargo police carrying out some older warrants. We know that during COVID, there were really limitations on how many people could be at the jail. So we did see a few people go to the jail, which also reduces the numbers that we see here. Um, fortunately, we're working really closely with the jail to develop discharge planning and different services that we can provide to try to prevent future stays in the jail, which are a lot more expensive than, than uh, the alternatives that we're trying to offer. Um, 
so the downtown engagement center even now being we, we operate from 8 a.m until 8 p.m the morning hours are primarily just inviting people in to get out of the elements have a cup of coffee uh, a lot of the folks that we serve are people who are sleeping rough or are sleeping in conditions outside of shelters um, although a number of people that we're, we are serving are also people that that are sheltered and some are newly housed and and this is more about just connecting with with workers in the community and so on um, during the afternoons so in the morning people can access health services they can make appointments they can access internet phones and so on during the afternoon which is when we have more staff come on so we have more capacity to offer services throughout the building that's when we start offering opportunities for people to take a shower do their laundry um, access their lockers where a lot of folks keep any excess belongings that they don't want to keep with them throughout the day every day um, we do a ton of screening for all sorts of different things crisis health uh, emerging health issues um, concerns that people have one of the things that I feel really really fortunate about is that we have since the last time I, I provided an update here we've hired a, a harm reduction RN Lisa LaFontaine she's here today she has an office in the downtown engagement center however she spends time in the syringe service program the withdrawal management unit and the shelter on a regular basis uh, the exciting part about that too is is part of her focus will be helping people identify or develop primary care relationships in the community which we know saves the community a lot of money produces better results for health outcomes helps us address some of the inequities that, that we're seeing um, it's just a better way of doing things so I can't wait to see a year from now uh, what what that what change uh, can happen in the community because of the fact that we have that nurse on site she has worked I don't know I guess it's endless and en endless examples of what she's already been assisting with um, promoting vaccinations helping to address uh, high-risk situations for the spread of disease spread of monkeypox spread of COVID and so on um, because she's a, a medical she's a health professional I think that she uh, people hold her in high regard she's really really great at developing relationships with the people that we serve she's also done some street outreach and it's just about accessibility she she's the face of accessibility and she's she's the face of, of uh, cultural safety for a lot of our folks that we serve so we're so excited to have her there um, do you guys have any questions about the specific numbers I don't want to tie up too much of your time madam chair this isn't specifically about the numbers but um, as you know probably I live downtown and it just seems like we're seeing more people with mental health and or CD issues and more bizarre kind of behaviors um, are you picking up on that and are you seeing that in the engagement center yes I would say that June and July were, were particularly complicated in terms of all of those um, we're facing a lot of complex issues I think as a community mm -hmm. uh, the downtown neighborhood you know has some of its own unique challenges I've met with a lot of business owners and a lot of people that live downtown to talk about some of the options that we have for us at you know within the harm, harm reduction division you know our approach is if we can get people housed as fast as possible that that alone helps prevent some of what we're seeing because the crisis of being homeless um, <clears throat> certainly perpetuates some of the challenges that people are facing in terms of their mental health substance use and so on uh, I think that we knew that there were going to be and that there was going to be an increase or we assumed there was going to be an increase in the challenges that we face in all communities after COVID um, a lot of stuff happened during COVID and I think that we saw an increase in homelessness we saw an increase in um, symptoms related to mental health because people weren't able to access providers the way that they had before and of course getting people back to those providers is really really complicated too um, in some cases it's people don't always recognize that um, the services they were receiving really did help improve the quality of their lives before COVID and so now they don't necessarily recognize that that, that that could be helpful again I think I, I, there's so many factors that go into it obviously and, and I know we don't have time to address every one of those here but I know that our goal is to respond in most situations to try to avert a more costly response or or at least create a more um, 
solution focused response to the folks that are really struggling out on the street. We can't do that alone, certainly. We, we have to partner with a number of different agencies around town. Everybody is short staffed. Very few agencies in town have enough staff to even provide the mental health and behavioral health services that we need right now. I don't know what the solution to that is, and I think that that's a, a longer conversation. But in the meantime, I think that our mobile outreach and uh, Desi and I and a few others have been talking about different alternatives or things that we can do to increase mobile outreach, uh, knowing that it's been highly effective in most areas of town and it's definitely been effective downtown, saves the community a ton of money and certainly produces better results than just continuously having to call for law enforcement or not doing anything at all. So, In regards to the larger issue and access to mental health and CD services, uh, I know we've had some conversations about the, I think it's acute psychiatric legislative interim committee. Um, are we planning to participate with a testimony? <laughs> I don't know. At this point, it's it's been hard. It it seems like when we are reading through, you know, some of the minutes from those meetings, is it really more focusing on like critical access hospitals in places that don't have maybe that um, acute care support and how to you know do that? And where in our area we you know we have the health systems, we have um, some services but we have to kind of shore up the response and the rapid response and maybe have a place where people can go more when they're in that crisis response but i don't i don't know from reading those minutes like i said I, it seemed like to me it was focusing on the rural places that didn't have support and how do they transform those rural access hospitals you know to have like psychiatric beds so I'm not, I'm not really sure. I was a little bit confused on where the focus of that was really going. Yeah, I think it is a little bit confusing, but if you look at the video from the last meeting, um, there was a pretty extensive conversation about the large gap in understanding between um, the presenter, which was the individual that did the study, and the legislators reporting to her what was actually happening on the ground. Um, and I know that the legislators I have talked to are interested in hearing from people that are on the ground and dealing with it on a daily basis. So I would just encourage you to, to right. provide that. I think it's also an important opportunity. So they have been focused on the, the rural communities and understanding how to fill the gaps in the role the critical access hospitals play. But if we have challenges here in Fargo, certainly voicing those. Um, you have a number of, of folks locally that sit on that particular committee. So it'd be good from an awareness standpoint that it's, it's not just a rural issue. It happens in the urban areas as well. And just calling attention to that. Having acute care access doesn't mean that we can meet the volume. So right, correct. And of course, you know, just really trying to keep everybody's focus on the solutions that we know can be out there. Um, again, prevention, providing supports early enough so that people don't get sick enough to need some of the more critical mm -hmm. or acute responses. Um, we have so much potential. In our community, we have a lot of really great partners. I think it's a matter, a matter of regrouping now but uh, certainly providing information to elected officials can't hurt. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I just wanna say thank you for all you're doing because it's not a lot of people that are out there who's actually stepping up to do those kind of work. Uh, the people, um, I understand that, you know, is in downtown engagement center. Is that where they sleep to as well if those individuals do not have like like a place to stay, or do they? It's just an engagement center that can come in there, in and out. No, yeah, the engagement center is open from eight to eight. We do try to connect people to shelter. A lot of people don't necessarily want to go into shelters. We have a number of people who are unsheltered in our community. Some of the folks are sleeping at a friend's house or family members. They're precariously housed. Somebody else essentially rules, you know, the space that they're staying. Uh, the Gladys Ray Shelter, you can see, has an average of uh, 21 beds filled per day. Um, we have about 30 beds for people, um, but we work really hard to connect people to other shelters in the community. We believe there's, you know, a little over a thousand people that are homeless in our in the Fargo Moorhead community on any given night. So certainly there aren't enough shelter beds, but at the same time, um, really trying to keep 
everybody's focus on affordable housing and housing programs mm -hmm. so that we can get away from shelter altogether is the solution. Um, I, I'm, I will say that we are seeing more people who are unsheltered this year than we have in previous years. Um, you know, there's, I can make a lot of guesses as to why that is. Um, but part of it, I believe, is because we do have an engagement center, so people who aren't accessing programs actually have a place now where they can start connecting to services. So I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing more people um, that are unsheltered. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I want to echo Naimal's statements about thank you for all that you do. Can you remind us when the engagement center opened? Well, <laughs> it, it's sort of... It was a soft opening. You know, we, we, we had a lot of things happening because we tried to open the engagement center. We did some quarantine and isolation. Then the shelter was located there for a short time while we went through uh, some improvements in that building. So I am not sure, but I, it was in the last year. Okay. I, I shouldn't say I'm not sure. I'm saying that we've, every day we've tried to increase access to different services. Sure. Right now our goal would be to get as many... Uh, folks in the community involved as possible in creating meaningful or ap opportunities to access meaningful activity. Um, we're, you know, I'm so excited about some of the things that we're already doing, but we definitely need a community response to offer some of the things. For example, recovery groups, well variety, um, cultural uh, activities, so that all of the people we serve have access to, to things that matter to them that are irrelevant. So, and that's what I was going to ask: was are you staffed? by paid staff or are there volunteer opportunities yet with the engagement center we have volunteer opportunities in all of our programs for sure um, for example we have a housing program where people can essentially shop in this this room of supplies so when they do move into housing they have dishes and a shower curtain and toilet paper and all of the things that are so hard to get and historically we've seen people move into housing and have nothing for a few days mm -hmm. Um, that's a great opportunity for, for volunteers in the community to help us just keep that program organized and accessible. Um, but we, you know, we, get, we do get calls from, from community volunteers, not to the level that we were seeing prior to COVID. I think it'll continue to increase, but everybody else that is in the building is a, staff, is a paid staff person, along with the other providers in the building that work for other agencies. Do you have like a web a website or a Facebook page where you can post information regarding like if you need volunteer work to to show up to be able to to help? We we currently have the Gladys Ray Shelter Facebook page. However, we are working with um, Holly Scott and, and the communications team to develop some other social media presence that are really that are things that are more specific to the engagement center and to a couple of our programs, knowing that each of our programs serves some really unique populations um, and that that's where people get their information, right? So uh, we are improving our Facebook or our social media presence, but you know, it's a work in progress. Yeah, so we can share it, you know, if, if we see a yes. post from you, we can definitely share it, you know, let the community member know. Because of course, you know, there's a lot of our kids out here doing bad stuff, you know, and we can be able to send them your way to be able to do some community works. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, I didn't hear anything about the safe syringe program. Can you? I'm I'm new to this, so can you explain how that works and how it's funded and who oversees it? What? what how does that go? All right, so the syringe services program is located in another building downtown. It's right behind the four building. And, uh, you know, we've been operating for five years, I believe, about that. My sense of time is just, it's not there anymore. <laughs> um, so we provide all of the resources and education and connection to services for individuals who are, um, who may use uh, who are injection drug users. Sometimes people are not. We provide any of the resources to empower people to take control of their own health, um, to make sure that they have accurate information related to how to keep themselves safe, how to keep others safe. We also know that when people are, are engaged in services at a syringe program, that they're much more likely to access other medical services and treatment programs that can assist them in getting out of that situation altogether. We provide a lot of education, and it, I think a lot of our, our energy right now is on overdose prevention. Um, Robin, who, who's part of our department, provides a lot of education in the community on the use of Narcan and naloxone and preventing overdoses. Um, 
Am I answering your questions? I'm worried that I'm going to take up too much time. So well, I, I know we are over time, and I, the staff is usually really great about staying after if you have other questions. Um, but appreciate all the engagement that we've had today. And thanks, Jan. Yeah, and it's it's a number of state grants and federal grants that help okay. help support that. Melissa Perfect. could tell me more about that. Well, I'm very excited about. Um, the, the work that you've been doing and the, the progress that's been made. And it sounds like you have some great additions to the team. So hopefully yeah. we can see some awesome things in the future. So thank you very much. Please reach out, email or by phone if you have additional questions after this. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you. Jan. All right. I don't see anybody for public comment. Um, so next meeting is October 14th. And so we will see you then. Right. Madam Chair, <clears throat> maybe it's pertinent to public comments, but oh. uh, recently we've received notice at the county level, and I'm certain the city has too, about settlements on the open, starting really? starting some of the settlements. Mm -hmm. And a part of that requires the establishment of a committee to oversee how those funds are spent, and there's there's some significant restrictions on what can be done with that money. It seems to me that somehow uh, CAS, that Fargo CAS Public Health should be at the forefront of making suggestions as to maybe cooperating between the city and the county uh, to fund those things together. Uh, and uh, establishing the group or committee that would oversee the allocations of those funds and how they're spent. Yeah, uh, I, I think we, we have an obligation to probably take a leading role in advising and recommending to those two entities mm -hmm. as to what we should do with those monies. Okay. That's a great point. Is something we can add to the agenda. I don't know what the timeline is for those funds and when you have to have a plan in place, but if we need to. I don't know the time frame at all, Dwayne. Do you know? What's that? Do you know what the time frame is with um, the funds? I do, and I don't. Uh, it was reported to us okay. at a settlement conference that we had on Monday. Um, I didn't take notes as to the dates, okay. but I did know that I was going to be here and I thought that we should mention it okay because I, I believe this group should be in the forefront of something in that area mm -hmm. okay. and it may be that we're talking about programs or assisting the programs that already exist and have been reported today okay if we can get the timeline pieces then maybe we can make a decision if we need to have an additional I'll, meeting before I'll see that I'll see that uh, our administrator gets the, okay. gets, gets the data to De Desi. Okay, perfect. And I'll make note of it, Desi. We can connect on that too. Yeah, and I can reach out to city administration too or city attorney and see what the terms are for. No okay. one has reached out to us at this point. So. Okay. Thanks for bringing that up. Excellent. I think we can find ways to spend that money. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.